Hello, uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, as a Brit, I feel I should start with an apology for what we've done to, uh, to Europe recently. Uh, there's an environment of uncertainty around, but I also think uh, an environment of tremendous opportunity and optimism. And I want to talk about uh, that today. How do you say I apologise? I speak terrible French in French. Excusez-moi, je parle français terrible. <laughs> so I will speak in English if that's okay with you. Uh, thank you very much for coming to spend time with us uh, today. Um, and I thought I would start um, just with a bit about Google and our mission and what we're trying to do in this world. And we have some amazing speakers coming uh, later in the day talking about this whole ecosystem that we're creating together. I'm always inspired by uh, this statement. The internet is for everyone. Tim Berners-Lee and the famous memo that he wrote when he first defined the kind of architecture that could work uh, for the World Wide Web. And it's very much at the heart of how we think uh, about innovation at, at Google. Uh, we want to organize the world's information and make it accessible and useful for everyone, for the poorest person through to the president. If you can't read, if you can't type, if you can't spell, we think that's our problem. We want to be able to give you answers that are accurate, relevant, and useful in real time. And that's what we're working really hard to achieve as many of you are as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about that. And we're proud to be here in France. You know, uh, it's very easy as, for us in Europe to talk ourselves down. We're actually quite good at much of this stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about what's happening uh, in France and in Europe in terms of Android and the mobile web and the opportunities uh, for all of us uh, ahead of us. And uh, particularly pleased recently that uh, with Android Nougat, uh, we were able to launch in Montelima. Uh, there we are with our Android arriving with the, the Nougat, the latest release. Uh, this is a name that was voted on by uh, many, many users uh, for the latest release of, of Android and marking uh, Android's connection to, uh, to France in, in a slightly surreal fashion, which I suspect, I suspect is appropriate. Now, I always like to start by just calibrating the audience. So, if possible, may I ask you some questions? Is that okay? Yeah? So, can I just ask you, uh, this is a, a digital system of voting, so it's not very complicated. I'd like to ask you to raise your hand and say yes if you have a connected device. Yes, everybody. Okay, now, the same thing again, but say yes, yes, if you have two connected devices. I have to speak up, because it's very dark at the back. Okay, three devices. Yes, 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 okay. I would say that we're now at the stage where we've got about 2.7, 2.8 devices. Let's see, four devices. Anybody with four? Yeah, yeah shout. This is a very advanced audience. Anybody with five connected devices? Oh my God, I've never had this kind of level of... Anybody with six on you, not at home? Oh, okay. Okay, we could go on all day. I think some people here have got connected bones, and that's a good thing. Um, but so, uh, there's an amazing uh, William Gibson quote, I'm sure you've heard, which is, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And if you think about that for a minute, maybe we've got three connected devices per person in the room. But it's early morning in the connected world. The majority of people on the planet are not connected at all. And what's fascinating about this short period of five years that we're in today is that we go from around 2.73 billion people connected to 5 or 6 billion people connected in such a short space of time. And in 10 years, potentially 10 billion people connected. It's estimated that if there are 5 billion people connected in 2020, there could be as many as 25 billion connected devices. And this changes everything. This is something that I find really uh, inspiring and something that is transformational for all of those people because when you have a connected device in your pocket, you have access to all the world's information, all the computing power, including translation in multiple languages, uh, and all the people on the web. The education, uh, the uh, fact-checking, uh, the sales and marketing that can be done, and the innovation that can be done when that many people are connected is hugely inspiring. And we don't know what it will be like, but we do know that the pace of change is 
going to get faster and faster as more people become connected for the first time. So today, it's early in this journey, still early, because the majority are not online, and the pace of change is slower than it's ever going to be again. It's an exciting time. It's an optimistic time, I would argue. And it's a time when there's huge opportunity for those of us who are here today working in this, uh, in this area. Now, we also, uh, aside from the connected devices, we're also in a world where the content on uh, devices is changing radically. You know, we, we uh, obviously have YouTube, uh, which was 10 years old uh, last year. And if you think about it for a moment, communicating in, in text... Uh, writing and reading, that's a, a very effective way of communicating in a number of contexts. You know, writing and reading fiction, the way it creates imaginary worlds that you really remember and connect with, uh, or short communications that allow you just to glance and see what's going on in the world. But in many cases, it's a very ineffective way of communicating because it's stripped bare. The information you get when you hear somebody speak and you see them and their gestures and their mood and uh, how they look and how they move around is much richer uh, and therefore it's not surprising that we've got this acceleration in digital video that's taking place. So with YouTube, uh, well over a billion users, hundreds of hours of video content uploaded every minute and uh, people are using it in ways that we'd never imagined. So let me ask you another question. Has anybody ever learned how to do something by watching a video on their mobile phone? Yeah? Would, would you like to share the kinds of things that, that you've learned? Anybody like to shout out what they've learned? Don't be shy. Cooking. Very popular. Many people learn cooking. What else? Yoga. Yoga. Very good. Physical activity, yeah. sports. Very good. What else? Android development, Android development of course. <laughs> Technical skills. Uh, very popular. What else? Ninja paper paper planes. planes. Making making and throwing paper planes. Ninja fighting. Somebody said down here. <laughs> to just back away from you a little bit. What else? Anything else that you've learned that we haven't mentioned? Sometimes I hear people fixing things. Their washing machine's broken, a car. Anybody learn to do that kind of thing? Yeah, what else? Somebody here? Fix, fixing? Fixing your phone. I hope your phone doesn't break very often. Uh, some great phones outside, which I've just been throwing on the floor uh, and putting into water. So those are, maybe you're in the market for those. But I mention that because uh, there's a big change in how we're learning. You met, lots of people there mentioned things they've learned. YouTube's 10 years old. I've asked pretty much every audience I've spoken to in the last year, have you learned stuff? And everybody's learned how to do fashion and makeup, cooking, uh, sports skills, technical things, as you talked about there, and in many cases, how to fix something when it's broken. Because in the moment, it's much more efficient to learn how to do something from sight, sound, and motion than reading an instruction manual. And I think this is something which is really changing. Uh, what's going on. If you look at the Khan Academy, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Khan Academy. Some of you may have even learned uh, whole subjects from there. came about where Salman Khan was teaching uh, his nephew and niece via Skype. And uh, they told him that they preferred the weeks when he was traveling and he had to make a video to his live teaching. And the reason was because, like all of you, you could stop and go back and look at difficult things a couple of times before you uh, use them again. You can skip over the bits that you know. It's a very efficient way and a very different way of learning. So the huge transformation in how we're using this kind of content. And what's fascinating about YouTube for us is we've never seen anything like it at the scale it's at now. It's actually accelerating. So the growth in time spent watching on YouTube is 60% year on year. That's getting faster. Uh, and uh, you know, it's an incredible change driven by mobile. Over half the views are now coming from mobile devices because you can access that video whilst you're sitting by your washing machine in the puddle of water on the floor trying to, fi trying to fix it, in all these moments that were never um, possible before. So another part of uh, the revolution. Now, this is, this is from ancient history. This is London 2012, uh, in the days when uh, Britain was a welcoming, open, forward-looking, uh, connected country. And uh, in the middle of this house, Tim Berners-Lee was sitting, typing, uh, this is for everyone. A big, meaningful moment for me as a, a Londoner and a sportsman and somebody who spends their time uh, on the web. But absolutely at the heart of how we think about uh, innovation uh, at Google and what we're trying to do, it's uh, about um, building products that work as well for the po poorest people as they do for the president. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, that in the context uh, of Android. So I started working at Google in 2007, and um, that's quite a long time ago now. 
And uh, this cupboard was one of the first things I saw in our offices. And on the cupboard, you can see these, these um, blue uh, buckets, and each bucket was full of mobile devices. And I said, oh, great, is this where I choose my new mobile phone? And they said, no, this is where we test the Google Search app. On every device, from every handset manufacturer, on every network, for every country in Europe. Wow. And uh, that was the barrier to entry at the time in terms of creating something that could scale to many people. For an app developer, you had to develop so many different versions of the app for all those different systems. Now, in 2006, just before that, Larry and Sergey had acquired a small company called Android uh, that was building operating systems for digital cameras. And at Google, what we're trying to do is, is, in our approach to innovation, really three things. We think about the big questions, we look for technical breakthroughs, and then we try to build for everyone through partnership. The big question for the founders for a long time had been, what would enable everybody, everyone on the planet, to have access to the internet? What if your mobile phone could be your access point to the internet? So they were really thinking about how to make that connection accessible and useful uh, to everyone. The technical breakthrough came when they thought about Android as an open operating system in collaboration with the industry that could be used by all of these different people to lower the barriers to competition and innovation and increase choice and innovation for everyone, for apps developers, for consumers, for telcos and for others. And many of you represented in the room uh, here today. So looking uh, to achieve that through the technical breakthrough of releasing this open source operating system. We launched our first smartphone in 2008, had 35 apps, it was available for one manufacturer on one network. Here we are today, there are over 24,000 different devices available that are, uh, that are powered by Android uh, from 1,300 different brands across the world. Uh, the choice uh, is unbelievable. And um, just by example, I was in Kenya, I got off the plane, and I went to a street market, and I, I was able to buy a $35 Alcatel Android phone. And so it suddenly is significantly more accessible, and now actually the challenge is almost uh, more about the cost of data and the efficiency of services and reaching uh, people in order to make it accessible for ever more people. So we, we had a long period of speculation, when will we see the first $100 smartphone, and now we're blown way through that barrier, and I think we're going to see continued innovation, making more devices available to more people and empowering them with uh, all of that computing power and all of that information and all those uh, connections to people. And in fact, uh, we uh, announced a partnership uh, some time ago with Orange uh, to bring more access to 17 more countries uh, across the African continent. So there's a huge shift happening there at the moment as people go online for the first time and uh, reach that, uh, that kind of power in their pocket. So proud to be doing that with Orange, uh, but also there are examples people represented here today uh, of how we're working together in France for this uh, ecosystem. So um, I think Gameloft are here today, hello? Bienvenue. This afternoon we're going to be hearing from the, the, the Gameloft team and uh, big fans there of what they did. Uh, started in the year 2000 here in France, uh, now 6,000 people. 90% uh, of their people are making apps and uh, available on thousands of devices. 99% uh, of the revenue comes from mobile uh, devices. 2.8 million Gameloft apps are downloaded every day across 190 countries. So you go from that cupboard full of barriers to a world where a team in France can develop an app that can be downloaded 2.8 million times a day in 190 countries. That's the kind of innovation that's happened in that period of time. It's absolutely phenomenal. And this kind of platform is built for everyone. You know, obviously, it can be customized in any way that you want, but allowing that level of standardization means that an app developer can reach everybody. And similarly, everyone can choose from millions of apps. And that's a, a stunning story, I think. That's on the software side. Also on the hardware side, you may have seen some of these things uh, outside also represented uh, here today. Arcos, of course, they were the first in France, the first company globally to manufacture an Android uh, tablet seven years ago. 70% of the devices they make today now are powered by uh, Android. 
and in the south of France, Wico, just looking outside, some fantastic products there, the, the Bluetooth speaker and the, their newest uh, device, um, really great devices. They're the number two manufacturer by sales in France, number five, I think, in Europe, uh, really successful, uh, selling millions of devices uh, a year. So the Android ecosystem is being successful uh, here in France and across uh, Europe as well. And others here, CrossCall, making the devices you can throw on the floor and you can put in the water. I'm going to have to buy one. Uh, and Lexibook, uh, you'll hear more from them later as well. So delighted to welcome friends uh, here to, uh, to show that this isn't just a story that's um, taking off in China or the US. Actually, in France, in Europe, uh, we've got people who are being really successful uh, in this world uh, as well. And if you think about it for a second, you know, how uh, this has taken off as a business opportunity, uh, if we look more broadly, it's estimated that something like $1.1 trillion uh, contribution to GDP now comes from the mobile ecosystem. $1.1 trillion uh, contribution to GDP. In France, something like 172,000 jobs are related to the Android ecosystem. Um, and uh, it's estimated that there could be as many as 4.8 million jobs created uh, working in the world of mobile uh, over the next few years. And as I say, Europe is good at this stuff. We're good at talking ourselves down, but we're actually good at this stuff. Not just the French companies I've mentioned uh, here, but Rovio, uh, King, Swift Key, uh, Blabacar, also another fantastic French company, uh, making a success through an app-based approach. And uh, we have so much more potential. If you think about the number of people that you can reach with your app going from 2.7 billion to 5 billion over the next five years. Everybody connecting for the first time wants that utility, uh, wants to be involved in these things, and uh, wants to connect in new ways that were never possible before. So it's a huge opportunity, and we're just at the beginning. It's still early, and the pace of change is slow relative to what it's going to be uh, in the future. And so, if I think about what we've learned from looking at the Android ecosystem, ask the big question, what if everybody could be connected by a device in their pocket that was cheap, but highly functioning? Look for the technical breakthrough. What if we worked together to create an ecosystem that was open source and could constantly get better and improve and innovate? And then building for everyone through partnerships, those partnerships with the Open Handset Alliance, with all those different manufacturers and brands and developers in order to create something that was brilliant and innovative and always moving uh, faster, and that's where we are. So, as I said, 1,300 brands making over 24,000 different devices uh, today. Uh, the average uh, Android device comes with 47 apps installed. A user, on average, installs 50 apps. Here's an interesting thing. Four out of five people customize their home screen, which makes you wonder, what's the one out of five person do? Surely everybody customizes their home screen, but there you go. So, huge choice, huge customization, and I'm sure you've done this before, but if you ever want to sort of think about that, just hand your phone to the person next to you and ask them to do something. And it's really hard, isn't it? You know, trying to find something on somebody else's phone because we've all got our choices of how we want to organize and use our devices. So it allows personalization in a, uh, in a way that was never possible before and mass personalization uh, as well. And, um, you know, sometimes we're asked questions about Android. Well, hang on, isn't it basically a way of Google just putting your apps in front of everybody else and doing some of the things we've seen in earlier generations of computing. And uh, clearly we're asked you know, quite tough questions about this sometimes. And I think when you just look at that story of open ecosystem development, of choice, innovation, and content creation, it makes sense to think this is something that's really creating value. Jobs and uh, choice for consumers and lower and lower price points and innovation. Uh, but I think it's also useful to think about ways in which we can see how easy is it for somebody to make those choices? Um, so how, uh, how long does it take to change your browser? Have a look. Hmm. Seven seconds so far. We're finding a browser. What are we going to download here? Which browser should we download? Hmm? Dolphin. It's the best web browser. Let's do that. So we've got a, now we've got a pre-installed browser, we want to get rid of that. And uh, there it goes, goodbye. And let's put the new one right down there so it's really easy to access in the tray. So 
35 seconds. So when you think about, you know, have we built this so that we can lock in the Google app suites and make sure that everybody's got our stuff? 35 seconds uh, to replace a browser with another browser. And on Android, um, we have huge numbers of downloads of all kinds of uh, different apps. So if I think about uh, Firefox as a browser, we didn't choose it that time, over 150 million Firefox downloads on Android. Or we think about Opera as a browser, over 200 million downloads uh, on Android. And Dolphin, we just heard, is the world's best, so I'm sure they're going to be uh, approaching that level. So users have got more choice than ever before, and making a choice between different apps is easier than it's ever been before. This is not a case of, I want to install a new browser on my desktop machine 10 years ago, I need to go to the store, buy a load of disks, come back, and spend ages putting the disk in, it's too technical for everybody else. Anybody can spend 34 seconds and replace something. So I think that's one of the things which we want to get across is this choice and customization creates competition because these people want to compete for your attention and want to be your best choice browser and creates uh, innovation because to do that, they're trying to differentiate and innovate in a way that people will really value. So I think that's something which we believe is a really powerful thing at the heart of the variety and choice uh, that Android is all about. Again, I just want to say a huge thank you uh, on behalf of all of us at Google for the partnerships and the interest and the support that you've given to, to this project. We're super excited to be working with you on all of this, and thank you very much. And again, apologies for my terrible French. Merci, au revoir. Thank you very much.